Welcome everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another CHP special episode. I cordially thank you all for tuning in. This time I've invited Mr. William Lindsay onto the program. And if there are any foreigners besides William Lindsay who have spent more time studying, researching, and climbing the Great Wall, I don't know who that might be. William has published eight or nine books about the Great Wall, including a couple new ones out on Earnshaw Books called Wild Wall, The Foundation Years, and Wild Wall, The Jianco Years. And so many of the articles written about William Lindsay, he's described as an author, runner, and conservationist. He's a longtime resident of Beijing, been there since the mid-80s. If you ever attended a lecture or read any of his books, William Lindsay is an acknowledged expert on the subject of the Great Wall, an object that has fascinated people all over the world from the time they first laid eyes on it. And we're going to discuss all that today. Mr. William Lindsay, welcome to the China History Podcast. Oh, thank, thanks very much, Laszlo. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. The pleasure is really all mine. So, William, let me ask, what's occupying your... Your Great Wall life and thoughts these days, this year, your, your 35th year there for the wall. Yeah, it seems I'm celebrating anniversaries quite regularly now. And um, <laughs> this year is my 35th anniversary of finishing uh, the journey along the wall that really laid the foundation for my future in China for the purpose of getting to know the Great Wall better. So 35 is a big year, um, you know, because um, you kind of start to wonder, am I going to make my 40th? And should I go on a uh, big journey along the wall to, to celebrate? Actually, I'm happy to report that uh, just as the Great Wall was a generation to generation project during many dynasties. In my family, um, there is a condition that we regularly um, refer to as wall fever. So um, as you can probably tell, I'm from Great Britain. And um, in Great Britain, we have a wall, Hadrian's Wall. Of course. And it was, it was my run along Hadrian's Wall in 1984 that is actually one of my big stepping stones to China. And um, because uh, of that run, you know, I came to China, I made my journey along the wall. Um, people say, you know, it's an obsession. And I say, well, actually, it's a fever because there's a very famous writer in Great Britain. He didn't write solely about Hadrian's Wall or history, in fact, he wrote just about the outdoors. And one of our great national parks is the Lake District. So uh, anyone who knows the Lake District in the UK will know Alfred Wainwright. And one of his most famous guidebooks is to the Pennine Way. And the Pennine Way crosses Hadrian's Wall. And in the book, uh, he says, when you get to Hadrian's Wall, uh, be careful because there is a healthy and rewarding pursuit known as wall fever. So, uh, yeah, I've had wall fever since that time. And um, my wife and I, we have two children, grown up children, James and Thomas, uh, Jimmy and Tommy for short. And of course, they have inherited this condition of wall fever. They've, you know, been at the wall since birth, virtually. And uh, as I speak, they are, I think, uh, you know, 90% of the way through a remarkable journey following the line of the Great Wall across northern China. So uh, they began uh, several months ago in July, and um, they've clocked up uh, 3,200 kilometers, which is about, I don't know, it's about 2,000 miles, isn't it? Um, so that's really, you know, one of the big events of the year, keeping in contact with them and, you know, talking to them about, wow, in my day in, in 87, it was like this. And now it's like this. Uh, some things have improved and some things have deteriorated. Uh, the wall is 35 years older. Uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. And uh, as you kindly uh, mentioned uh, earlier, 
uh, by chance marking this 35th year with the publication of my memoir, autobiography, which is called Wild Wall. So, yeah, um, uh, a busy year in terms of, you know, all of these big events and memories. Not such a big year in terms of getting out and seeing the wall in as many places I, as I would normally do. Because, uh, you know, China is the, uh, the last bastion of um, trying to avoid any COVID infections. And that has greatly restricted people's movement over here. So I think I've only been up to the wall on about 25 occasions this year, which is a, it's like a zero for me. I'm normally getting up to the wall for more than 100 days per year. Yeah, I've been following uh, Jimmy and Tommy on uh, Twitter and on their YouTube channel, and that looks like a great mm. experience. Great experience, great adventure. You know, they're very uh, familiar with one particular location because, you know, my family has had a base at the foot of the Great Wall, about 100 miles uh, north of Beijing, where, you know, the classic Great Wall winds its way through the mountains. So, you know, they've grown up um, seeing the Great Wall literally in their backyard. And the Great Wall for them is, you know, a couple of weekend walks. Uh, But to really know the Great Wall, there are various challenges. And one of the challenges is the immensity of what we simply in English call the Great Wall of China and what the Chinese call the uh, Wan Li Chang Chang. And it really never fails to surprise me how vast a geographical expanse that this monument from various dynasties, uh, you know, ranges across. Although it's, it's actually quite humbling to be reminded of that because, you know, we're living in an age where we think we know everything, <laughs> but, you know, uh, People can Google and um, Yahoo or, or you know, the Great Wall and the names of locations. But between the famous names, there are hundreds of other places. And um, I often kind of summarize the immensity of the Great Wall by saying, well, the Great Wall is not a place. It's tens of thousands of places. So let's talk about the Great Wall. The high school, college, popular Chinese history narrative tells us that Qin Shi Huang connected all the individual walls to create the Great Wall. Mm. What walls were being built pre-Qin Dynasty, and who were they trying to keep out? And did different warring states have different kinds of walls? Uh, yeah, well, it's it's quite a complicated question. There's a lot of long walls before <laughs> Qin Shi Huang's famous Wan Li Chang Cheng, but I think uh, it will help listeners by kind of going back to the very beginning, it seems the practice of building a wall around a place to live is very, very ancient in China. And, um, you know, actually, I'm not very literate, but um, it's worth knowing that the Chinese character for town, city and wall is all the same. So it's uh, Cheng, C-H-E-N-G. And uh, if you look at that character, part of the character on, on one side is actually the character used for Earth. Two. Yeah. I often say this is literally the oldest historical evidence for the material used for the most common kind of wall construction in China, the earth wall. And it shows us that in the minds of the early Chinese, whether they were living, you know, by themselves or in a little cluster or in a settlement that may now be deemed a hamlet or, you know, going up in scale, village, town, city, they felt safe if they were living behind a wall. I mean, I often explain to people that my perception is that the earliest people in China desired to live in a place that gave them shelter, you know, a roof over their heads. 
it was a place where food could be stored, where a livelihood could be lived, and it was a safe place behind a wall. And, of course, in the early days, uh, the enemy probably wasn't coming from very far away. Uh, it could have been just, you know, the neighbours in the next valley um, from a different family, um, you know, a, a few tens of miles away. It could have been perceived enemies in the dark. It could have been wild animals. But eventually, as the centuries rolled on, an enemy from afar uh, appeared over the, the horizon, the northern horizon, and uh, turned out to be so lethal. Uh, these people were such fearsome warriors that it drove the Chinese into, for sake of simplicity, rethinking, redesigning the shape of their walls from being circular enclosing walls to being linear walls of extraordinary length, rooted cross-country with the purpose of stopping the enemy progressing on their horses. Who were these enemies? Were these the Mongols, Turkic, people from the north? Uh... Well, because we're dealing with such a sweep of history here, um, I think the best term to use is uh, a term that describes their way of life. And that was an unstable uh, way of life, nomadic, uh, relying mm. on you know, the, 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 uh, the raising of animals, uh, and that uh, lifestyle was very precarious, could easily be uh, damaged, uh, to be re could easily be wrecked by a, uh, a natural event, such as a, a drought in summer, such as a, a, a particularly cold winter, or disease uh, that could, could wipe out livestock. And, of course, any event like that robbed people of their immediate future livelihood, hunger, starvation threatened. And the only way to break away from that threat was to make a journey. And uh, the journey across the grasslands of 100 uh, miles probably wouldn't bring any, any relief because it would be very likely that the neighbours suffered from the same drought, the same winter, or the same disease. Um, so uh, a long distance journey was eventually necessary and it led the people south because, of course, that's uh, warmer weather. Eventually it led to land that was occupied by the Chinese who lived in clusters and who were a lot more organized about their way of life. They had transitioned from... Uh, um, raising animals to raising animals and growing crops. And particularly, you know, they planned for the future. They stored surpluses in their barns, uh, in towns and cities. Uh, the states stored uh, surpluses in granaries. And they had the ability to, um, to ride the natural disasters that came their way. But uh, the man-made disaster that was the... Uh, attack of nomadic tribes on Chinese land was um, unprecedented, obviously, at one point. And uh, it had the Chinese wondering, what the hell should we do next? And uh, I think this, you know, let's, let's nail a date. Uh, in my mind, round about 300 BC seems to be a, a turning point because uh, the histories record at that time uh, there was a uh, state in the northern part of what we would know as today's China uh, called the Zhao State. And uh, the, the king of the state was in, well, more than a quandary uh, at the, uh, the occurrence and the regularity of these raids on his land by these people that changed the rules of warfare. And the people that came from the north were not in chariots and they were not on forts. They were just riding horses. And uh, they were superb horsemen. And what was more threatening was they used weapons from the back of a galloping horse very skillfully, particularly the bow. 
And uh, eventually, King, the king, which I haven't named, I tend to avoid littering my explanations of the Great War with too many historical names, too many dates. Because, you know, I'll tell you why. I've earned my livelihood in the last 25 years by explaining the Great War to people fresh off the boat, you know, arriving at Beijing Airport. They've read about me. They've come to learn about the Great War. And the easiest way to confuse them is to, to, you know, introduce the dynasties and emperors' names and generals' names and what have you. So, um, yeah, but I'll name the, the king. This is King Wu Ling. And uh, he reigned, as my, if my memory serves me right, for about 30 years, uh, round about uh, just before uh, 300 BC. And um, it was he who decided that he needed a new way of warfare. He needed to adopt a new style of warfare to face up to these increasingly regular raids. So the first thing he did, you know, if if you're being attacked by cavalry, you uh, make your own cavalry. You train your own men to ride horses. You, You train them in the skills of archery and you try and get them to do both things at the same time. And of course, you know, this couldn't be done in a boot camp over a short period of time. But eventually the histories tell us that he trained up cavalry, he even altered the style of dress. So, you know, the baggy sleeves didn't interfere with, as an archer would reach for an arrow from his quiver as he drew the bow, all of this, you know, bat wing sleeve, hand clothing didn't interfere with the bow. Um, But still, you know, the cavalry that he trained up just were no match for the professionals coming from the north. So it's at this time he decided to, I think, do what the Chinese were good at and avoid what they were bad at. So the Chinese, I think, at this time were not very skilled at open field warfare. They liked to, you know, face the enemy in generally flat terrain, almost at this stage of history, battles were almost arranged like a sporting fixture. And then both sides could use their infantry and use their chariots. But of course, this couldn't be done in this new theatre of war that was evolving along the northern frontier. So um, in an attempt to avoid being caught out in the open there, What were the Chinese good at? What were the people of the Zhao state good at? Well, of course, they were good at doing as they were told. Uh, They had uh, traditionally practiced the construction of wall building around all their settlements. All they had to do was change the shape and put in uh, an extra few years of work, and they could have a, a linear defense of extraordinary length, built cross country, exploiting the lie of the land. And when it was built, it basically turned the table. It not only leveled the battlefield, I think it tilted the battlefield in the favor of the Zhao state, because when their soldiers stood up on that wall, first of all, they could see the enemy coming from afar. Secondly, as the enemy got closer, the range of weapons used from the high position uh, was greater than the range of those same weapons used from uh, a flat position because they had gravity on their side. So the simple advantages were if you get your people to invest in a structure that delivers these advantages, then those advantages are going to last for a long time. And the advantages are you have the height, which at this stage of warfare was of critical advantage because height gave better range. Whatever was released from height went further and faster and had a greater chance of stopping the enemy. 
But, you know, uh, I, I've talked to many, many audiences and um, the often the most interesting audience to talk to are very young children. And for an audience of children to listen to that 10 minutes explanation, that's not going to work. So I would tell kids the first wall, the first Great Wall of China in my eyes dates from about 2,300 years ago. And it was simply built by the Chinese to make the enemy get off their horses. That's it. Was Zhao State the only one that was building walls? What about the Yen or any of these other most northern states? Yeah, well, good question. And um, I know there's a lot of history buffs out there. And uh, so let me kind of summarize for those that aren't so... Uh, familiar with the uh, the political geography of the land. You have no idea how erudite my China history podcast listeners are. So <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so round about um, several s- centuries BC in the so-called Warring States period, many small states existing. And uh, of course, they're not very friendly towards one another. Uh, so you, but you still have the copycat society. The copycat economy. So when one state builds a wall, others tend to follow. And from the archaeological evidence that we have, off the top of my head, although I haven't seen all of these remnants myself, I've only seen some of them, it seems about 10 warring states at least build structures that we would call that the Chinese call Changcheng, long walls. Between 300 BC and 221 BC, which of course is a key date because that's when the Qin state um, uh, succeeded in creating uh, the Qin empire out of all the conquered warring states. At this time, about 10 different states had long walls, Changcheng. So, Many people say to me, okay, is there a difference between uh, a Changcheng, a long wall, and a Wanli Changcheng, which is a 10,000 Li wall? And, uh, well, I think there is. It's a bit of a name game. It's a bit of a, an academic point. But I think uh, I'd like to give my uh, I'd like to give listeners my view on it, and also um, Sima Chen's view on it. Uh, this term, Wan Li Changcheng, first appears in records of the Grand Historian, uh, written by, of course, uh, uh, Sima Chen. So uh, Sima Chen. Um, in one of his later chapters, he, he actually says, I have been to the northern frontier and I have seen a Changcheng and it's Wanli and it starts here and it goes through such mountains and it ends there. And I think this is a very interesting uh, page in, in, in his history. Actually, one of my... Uh, projects of about a decade ago was uh, The Great Wall in 100 Objects. I have the book. And uh, yeah, yeah. So in, in my choice of 100 objects, there are, you know, there are a handful of books. There's uh, Franz Kafka's The Great Wall of China, very nice, you know, 10,000 word essay uh, by a fellow who'd never been to China, but he uses The Great Wall as this, uh, as this, uh, 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 platform for um, you know uh, exploring the the psychological toil that this mega project had on its builders. Uh, another book I chose in, in my fifty objects was uh, the Great Wall of China by William Edgar Guile, which is the first book in any language solely about the Great Wall. And another book that I chose, or page of a book, was. Uh, uh, Sima Chen's records of the Grand Historian because he uses the brand name Wan Li Changcheng and he attributes 
the work of Emperor Qin Shi Huang as being basically the mastermind of the Great War. Because he, who, you know, uh, having conquered all the land, decided that, uh, well, to consolidate his power, the long walls kind of dividing the old states, they should be dismantled because they could possibly be used in the future by, you know, people who wanted to break up the big grand new empire. But he retained three states on the northern periphery of his empire. And one of those walls was the wall that I referred to earlier, the Zhao State Wall. Another was the Qin State Wall that had been built partly by him. And another was a wall much further to the east, the Yen State Wall. So actually, you know, again, explaining this to children, I say that uh, the formula you've got to remember, kids, is Zhao Wall plus Qin Wall plus Yan Wall equals Qin Dynasty Great Wall. And that's the formula. So, you know, Great Wall history, it's so dominated by what happened in the Qin and the Ming. What were the notable historic moments in Great Wall history that weren't Qin or Ming? It sort of seems like whenever you read anything or see anything, there's the Qin Shi Huang story and then a blank space. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, late Ming and Qi Qi Guang. And then we start to hear more about uh, the wall. But what about not including those guys? Yeah, that's also a good question, and uh, I think... That's a lot of history there, from Qin to Ming. A lot of history. Uh, It's a sweep of, you know, basically from 300 BC until the end of the Ming in the mid-1600s. So it's, for the sake of argument, it's a couple of thousand years. And uh, when I began my 50 Objects project, I was concern that exactly as you said i was going to have a a few objects at the beginning and a ton of things at the end you know from the ming and there's going to be like a desert in the middle and i was really keen on finding objects between the two bookends as it were that would explain what was going on with wall building in china at the time and if there was no wall building to explain, why not? Because I thought that was an equally fascinating point. You know, times of peace, times of war. So uh, actually, a lot was going on. There's a lot of detail and there's a lot of information out there. And there's a lot of objects to tell these stories. Uh, but back to the 50 Objects Project, I managed to find even objects from the Song Dynasty that told a particular episode of the Great Wall story. Uh, so anyway, but to, give your, to give your question a more direct answer, how many Chinese dynasties were there? Well, that depends on, you know, uh, how long must a dynasty last for? What territory must it dominate? But I think um, the figure I often go for is if we look back over these thousands of years of Chinese history, there were approximately 65 dynasties. You know, and there's the Ming, Ting, Tang, Bing, Dong, Ding, Yong, you know, all the, the, the rhyming sounds. And um, Joe Ag from the other side of the world only knows the Ming, only knows the Song, and only knows the Qin. But there's a lot in between no one's ever heard of. Uh, But of these 65 dynasties or so, 16 at least built long defensive structures that are regarded as great walls of China. And a lot of confusion results in the refusal of people to call the Great Wall what it really is. It's the Great Walls of China. They are the Great Walls of China. You know, I'm constantly asked, how long is the Great Wall? The question that I fire back is, 
which Great Wall are you talking about? Yeah, that's like the Silk Road, too. There was not one single Silk Road either. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about the, uh, the school, the college um, view that Chu Zhu Huang 2,000 odd years ago did this. Uh, actually, there's also the tourist guide um, description that, that yeah, Chin Shi Huang organized the construction of the first Great Wall. And as our glorious history rolled on, many other emperors added to the structure and it grew in length. And uh, the final renovation was a few hundred years ago in the Ming. And most of the Great Wall we see today dates from that time, which is actually. Um, a load of guff. <laughs> and uh, history is history, but, you know, I'm not an historian. I'm, if I'm asked to describe, to describe myself, I'm, I say I'm a subject, su- I say I'm a subject matter expert on the Great War. And um, actually, you need to be quite a bit of a geographer, quite a lot of an archaeologist, quite a bit of an historian to get to grips with the subject. But archaeology can tell us a lot. And um, this century, there have been two major surveys on the archaeological remains of the Great Walls of China. The first took place between 2003 and 2007. So for five years, archaeologists and surveyors in every province of North China were instructed to find and measure the extant sections of the Ming Dynasty Great Wall. And in 2008, they announced that the Ming Dynasty Great Wall of China, uh, the remains that we can find, measure 8851 kilometers, which is about 5,500 miles. Next, the teams went out further afield because the walls that were built pre-Ming have a larger geographical distribution. So the archaeologists went out to measure all three Ming walls. And a couple of years later, they announced, and this figure is really easy to remember, they announced all pre-Ming great walls collectively measure one, two, three, four, five kilometers. <laughs> Isn't that handy? Yeah. So if we add the pre Ming, one, two, three, four, five K, with the Ming, eight, eight, five, one, we get a grand total of the length of the Great Walls of China extant on the landscape of the People's Republic today. And that figure is 21,196 kilometers. More than Wan Li. More than Wan Li. Well, you know, I think you could do a whole episode on the length of the Li throughout the dynasties. And, uh, you know, when you're out in the sticks in China, uh, I mean, back in 87, you know, I could hardly speak a word of Chinese. But one of the early terms I mastered was Gong Li kilometers. And then in the countryside, you know, I, w- I would be asking people, Chang Chang, Do Shao Gong Li. And uh, farmers would say, Ang, Chang Chang, Wu Li Di, Nang Da. Okay, so quick translation. I, William to farmer, how many kilometers away is the Great Wall? Farmer to William, after five Chinese Li, you will arrive there. But William didn't know the difference between a metric kilometer and a Chinese Li. And there's a big difference. And apparently there's a difference as to whether, you know, the Li is uh, uphill or downhill. It's kind of a, a rural measure of the difficulty of a journey on foot. Well, I've always considered a, a Li. Well, when I learned the character Li, my Chinese teacher yeah. said it's a third of a mile, and I've just stuck with that ever since. <laughs> yeah, it's a, 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 about 500 meters, yeah. It's confused people, um, well, it's confused as foreigners. 
from the very early stages. So can we switch now to 1793? The great, the great visit to um, the Qing Empire by uh, Lord McCartney, yeah. Or the Earl McCartney, Paul's ancestors. Earl McCartney, yes. Uh, so so sent, uh, sent over by uh, our King, uh, George III. Um, and after, you know, a long voyage, they arrive in China. And they, they, they come up to Peking uh, in 1793. Uh, and it's, I think it's August. And uh, they kind of check in uh, with the, uh, the ministry. Um, and they're, they're told, oh, um, the emperor, the Chenlong emperor, is, uh, he doesn't spend the summer, you know, in, in, in the city. He goes out into the countryside uh, north of the wall because, you know, he's a, he, a Manchu ancestry. He wants to get out of the urban environment back into mm-hmm. the hills there, do a bit of hunting, enjoy the cooler temperatures. And the Brits, um, they say, oh, can we go and see the emperor? Because, you know, we, we've, brought, we've brought him some nice gifts, including this birthday gift. And, uh, um, and they get permission to head north to the Imperial Resort, which is in a city now known as Chengde. So it's about, it's about 150 miles north of today's Beijing. And uh, so the, the British delegation, which was about 200 strong, set off. And after about three days, they saw this, these strands of whitish rock running like a ribbon along the mountain ridges on the northern horizon. And as they got near it, they realized that this was the, the famous Chinese war. Why was it famous? Well, first of all, I think the uh, uh, listeners will appreciate that people in Europe got to know the Great War because it was marked on maps of China, printed and published in Europe, from 1584 onwards. Yeah, I saw that in the uh, in your book, The Great Wall and 50 Objects, the theater of the whole world. Yeah. Was that, that was the first time Europeans got to lay eyes on it? Yeah, well, if they were extremely wealthy, uh, oh, because uh, that, that, that map of China that you referred to, uh, which was uh, included in the 1584 edition of the Theatre of the Whole World, uh, an atlas per se, that was, uh, that was published by uh, Abraham Ortelius in Antwerp. And it contains a very vivid image of, of what we now know as the Great War. Um, and there's there's an annotation on the map saying it's uh, uh, one thousand uh, no four hundred leagues in length. So again, <laughs> we need some conversion here. That's about you know fifteen hundred German miles or something. So yes, um, the learned and the wealthy knew of the existence of a Chinese war, and I'm sure within uh, Earl McCartney's diplomatic uh, entourage knowledge of the chinese war would 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 be uh, would be known but to see this structure uh was just really to appreciate that thing on the map that was fabled to be you know uh, more than a thousand miles long was potentially uh real anyway the the, the british got to the foot of the wall in a town called Gubeko, you know, the ancient North Pass. And they were given what would be called in Britain a right royal reception. You know, the local Mandarin brought out the, um, uh, the garrison and there was a lot of ceremony. And apparently the British, they camped uh, within the town wall, which links to the Great Wall. And they stayed there for a couple of days. And um, in the, on the wall of the study I'm speaking to you from in Beijing, I have uh, a couple of prints from the record of the, uh, the McCartney embassy to China. And one of those prints um, is a, uh, is a uh, collection of plans, sections and elevations made on the spot 
uh, by Captain William Parrish in 1793. And these are very accurate architectural drawings, giving us the height of the wall, showing us that every now and then there's a structure called a, uh, uh, a watchtower, and uh, the tower has windows, and it's multi-storied, and there's a door, uh, and so on and so on. So we get this wonderful view of the wall uh, from the British, um, coincidentally passing through it. Um, and uh, interestingly, in the journal that these drawings come from, which is kept in the British Library in London, which, of course, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, thumbing through at leisure, there are three Chinese characters. And you can see they're literally painted on, on the parchment. Wan Li Chung. So they've missed out the Chang. Wan Li Chung. 10,000 Li Wall, which is a short form of 10,000 Li Long Wall. So anyway, the point I'm coming to here is the British, in their account of the embassy, they wanted to tell their readers, well, you know, what does this Wan Li Chung mean? Translation... 10,000 Li wall, we need to convert the Li into miles. And they, I think they rounded it off at 3,750 English miles. And pretty much since that time, the Great Wall of China, as it would become known a little bit later, was always given this, you know, bullet point, 3,750 miles long. And the whole point, I think, of uh, Sima Chen's term, uh, Ran Li Chang Chang, uh, 10,000 Li Wall, was not really the wall is 10,000 Li long, that the wall was immeasurable. Wan, in this context, does not mean 10,000. It means it can't be measured. It's boundless. And I think that's an important point. Right. One, sure, everything. But you stick a one in front of it, and that meant huge. Yeah. Now, of course, yeah. one is much with inflation. One doesn't get you much. It anymore. doesn't. No, no. You, you need to it's got to start at Qian Wan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's look at the two the two real stars when we when we think of the Great Wall. There's always when you think of the Qin Wall, you think of Meng Tian, and with Ming yes. Dynasty, uh, Qi Qi Guang. Let's talk about Meng Tian. What did he really do, actually? Why is he associated? Mm. Uh, why is he associated with the wall so much? Well, uh, Meng Tian was uh, apparently one of Qin Shi Huang's uh, most respected, uh, powerful strongmen, army men. Uh, obviously, played a major part in the uh, the, the the conquering of of, uh, of neighboring states. But importantly, once Qin Shi Huang established the Qin Empire and the Qin Dynasty, Meng Tian was given the task of ousting a bunch of nomads, basically Xiongnu, uh, Huns, who were south of the Yellow River. Now, if listeners can uh, imagine the, the path of the Yellow River in North China, there's that big loop, the big loop. The Ordos Loop. The Ordos Loop. Uh, so uh, the Yellow River being, well, you know, the mother river of China, the, ch uh, the cradle of Chinese civilization, Qin Shi Huang didn't feel very comfortable about having nomads settled within the loop of the Yellow River, uh, especially so because, you know, he established his capital just outside uh, of today's Xi'an, uh, you know, where his terracotta warriors have been visited um, in recent decades by so many. So uh, Meng Tian's first great military glory in the period of the Qin Dynasty was ousting the Huns from within the Yellow River Loop. And having done that, a few years later, uh, according to uh, Sima Qian, I think it's 215 B.C., so this is just five or six years after the establishment of the Qin Empire. 
uh, Meng Tian is given a second major task, and that is to take uh, a huge number of workers to the new northern frontier beyond the Yellow River uh, in the north to piece together a much, much longer wall. So, you know, this is where uh, sustainability uh, has, its, uh, has its say. Why waste three darn good walls up in the north? So, yeah, all that needed to be done was to hook them up, do a bit of building in between and perhaps repair them um, in a few places. But nevertheless, this would require a huge amount of labor. And Sima Chen refers to approximately 300,000 laborers rounded up in the name of the, the Qin army needs you to build the Wanli Changcheng. And their march north, uh, this is, you know, there's the, we could do a whole podcast on this. There's the, there's the story of Meng Jiangnyu, the woman who's, who's, whose husband is among one of these 300,000. And of course, she's never going to see him again. Uh, there's the story that the, 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 the actual logistics of this 300,000 strong uh, group of corvée laborers, we think, marching north, left such a footprint that from the air, a bare line heading north from Xi'an to northern Shanxi to the Yellow River can be seen from the air. Well, you know, uh, you could see the Great Wall from outer space. Uh, National Geographic in uh, February 1923 said so. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And we all believe that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, this, this path that they made by walking became known as the Jidao, the direct road. And, uh, of course, when all the laborers got there, they set about building the wall and Meng Tian was, you know, doing a good job. Um, And then I think things went sour in the first winter because there was no infrastructure for growing food on this frontier. So the geographically, the area uh, we are talking about is about a good hundred miles north of the Yellow River Loop. So people who are familiar with the geography there, you know, there's uh, Baotou, uh, Baotou, the city of Baotou. Um, and I am mentioning that name because I have, I have been to the northern frontier and I got there by taking a train to Baotou about 20 years ago and then taking a bus from Baotou due north for, for, for about um, uh, 60, 70 miles or so, and looking in these dry Gobi hills for the remnants of the Great War. And that was quite a search. Uh, I was with a, a good Chinese friend, Yang Xiao, um, and uh, we got off a bus in a village, which is today's Inner Mongolia, and we asked around. Uh, we gathered an audience and people said, why have you come here? I think few of them had, had, had seen a foreigner in their, in their village before. And we said, well, we, we, we're based in Beijing. We're Great Wall researchers, and we're looking for the Qin War. And people said, oh, there's no Great War here. And uh, we had been told by the then leading Chinese expert on Great Walls of China, Professor Lord Javert, that there was wall in them, their hills, and it was verified as being Qin wall by the Inner Mongolian Archaeological Institute. And, uh, but, you know, uh, even asking directions in a town or a city, three, you know, uh, smartphone guidance years was like, you know, directions in Chinese are super vague. Like in London, if you ask people, you know, uh, how do I get to such a restaurant? They will, they will tell you in detail and they'll repeat it. Uh, but in China, it's uh, just, uh, oh, Jebia, Nebia, Nebia. Uh, that way, that way, that way. <laughs> okay, so anyway, to cut the long story short, we ignored the villagers' um, uh, insistence that there was no great wall there. And we spent three days uh, walking around the village in the hills 
you know, going to high points, getting the binoculars out and looking for some linearity, crossing the hills. <clears throat> and then it, this was February. Uh, it was very cold. We, we, we'd run out of dried noodle. Uh, there was some snow to melt, so we could still have a cup of tea and a cup of Nescafe. But we could see our days were numbered and we returned to the village and we were waiting for the bus. And um, the, the, the were, we gathered a, a different, slightly different audience and it's the same questions. Where are you from? What are you doing? And we said, we've been looking for the Great Wall. And one fellow said, oh yes, I heard there was some Great Wall in the hills here. And we said, what, you heard? He said, yes. And we asked, who did you hear from? And he said, I heard from my brother. And we said, how does your brother know? And he said, my brother has like 1,300 goats and he herds in these hills. And our ears really pricked up. And we said, where is your brother? And this is the funny bit. This is like 2003. He said, I'll phone him now. And he whipped out a mobile phone, which was, you know, in those days, about the size of half a French, you know, stick loaf. It was about nine inches long and four inches wide. And he phoned his brother and his brother answered. And the conversation goes like, hey, brother, there's a couple of scholars here from Beijing and they want to see the Great Wall. Do you know where it is? Well, I see it every day. Oh, can you... <laughs> can I bring them here to meet you? Of course you can. Literally 20 minutes later, we got out of this van beside a dirt road and a herder came down a ravine. And uh, after about 40 minutes walking, we, we came to the, the crest of a hill and lo and behold, a few hundred yards away was an unmistakably... Great War from 2,300 years ago, about uh, eight, nine feet in height, the outside face still intact, sharp, clearly quarried, cut stones. And you could see this structure not snaking away for miles, but certainly snaking away for several hundred meters. And in the distance, in not such good condition, just snaking away for miles. And we had found what uh, we have since verified as being Zhao State War incorporated in the Qin Dynasty Wanli Changcheng, which was later utilized by the Western Han Dynasty. So actually the wall we saw, we believed, was used more or less continuously from at least 300 BC to perhaps 2nd century AD. How does the China authorities preserve something like this that's outdoor? I mean, what was it, rammed earth walls? I mean, every time it rains, it has to lose some size. Well, Lazo, the, the, the morphology of any wall depended on what building materials the builders could find locally or manufacture locally. So as you cross North China, the landscape changes because the geology changes and the available natural raw materials change. And although there was some manufacturing of materials in the early stages of the history of Great Walls, the majority of materials were natural. Uh, manufactured materials, uh, obviously, you know, the Ming Wall, everyone can imagine that. A Ming Wall uh, in the mountains north of Beijing, the classic view, uh, the foundations, the facing walls, quarried blocks, and the, the top bits and the towers, bricks. So bricks are manufactured, they're kiln-fired, um, you know. And then even if we go back... Um, uh, a couple of thousand years to the Western Han Dynasty. So there was a lot of wall building round about uh, 110 BC. For about 30, 40 years, a lot of wall building. 
Uh, there were some manufactured materials. I mean, if you call an adobe brick a manufactured material, well, you know, it's kind of mud and straw packed in a wooden frame and uh, left to dry in the sun. There is some process there, I suppose, you know, that's defined as manufactured, yeah? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the majority of the materials are just natural, you know. Uh, so, you know, the wall I just described on that little expedition of close on 20 years ago now, that wall was quarried rock for sure. Uh, and the, obviously a lot of labour at that time. The Iron Age had been going on for several hundred years at that time. And, you know, the Iron Age... Iron Age weapons are, are very extensively uh, written about and known from the time. But, you know, um, there was equally a great building and agricultural revolution because of, you know, better iron tools for plowing and uh, cutting, cutting rock and, and moving bulky materials. So I think the Iron Age, you know, has a, there's an element of the importance of the Iron Age in, in the story of the early wars. But yeah, preserving these walls, uh, the Great Walls of China, the remnants of, of long defensive structures built by 16 dynasties strewn across such a vast area, you know, equivalent to the breadth of Europe from, from Ukraine to Portugal, equivalent of, you know, the, the, the US from east to west coast. It is uh, the, the largest cultural relics protection challenge in the world and uh, I got involved in that um, 20, 20 some years ago in 1998 I was uh, I was really uh, shocked on the uh, the way in which photographers keen on capturing you know the great wall at dawn you know the bathed in orange light how they would you know, they they were using Hasselblad cameras that cost you know four five thousand dollars, and uh, you know just peeling a, 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 a Kodak or a Fuji film out of its yellow box and leaving the plastic container and the foil and the box on the floor. You know, snap snap snap, gorgeous light, and then you know, oh now. Um, the light's not so so golden and then having the sausage and the bread and just not throwing the litter just dropping it it was such a natural motion in those days i mean people thought the, the government does everything even cleans up after us but not on the great wall um i started to do that and uh, no i think initially i thought well i'm just i'm just kind of making myself feel better, I'm at least doing something. But it led me to uh, talk to the top man in China responsible for cultural heritage protection. Um, the, the litter cleaning events that I led at the time, they made front page news. And we collected the cuttings. My wife phoned the state's administration for cultural heritage and I went to see Mr. Peng and Mr. He, and uh, we had a long conversation about the Great Wall of China and do, are there any laws to protect it? You know, everyone knew that the Great Wall was a World Heritage Site, you know, UNESCO World Heritage. A symbol of China. Yeah. Um, it mentioned in the national anthem. I mean, uh, it must be protected well, huh? There was not a single law or regulation to protect the Great Wall of China. And the interesting things that came out of that meeting I had with those officials was, one, well, the Great Wall was a military defense and it's made of rock and stone and it's remote and it doesn't really need any protecting. This was one point that was made to me. And the second point was... Well, you know, China is reconstructing, you know, our towns and uh, communications, roads, railways. We need to do a lot of work. And every time uh, a digger, uh, 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 there's any, uh, you know, foundations for buildings dug, we, we unearth a tomb or a cemetery and we've got to put all our resources for archaeology into, you know, rescuing these ad hoc 
um, discoveries. And I came out of the meeting realizing that uh, the future protection of the Great Wall was going to be a major challenge because the UNESCO badge offered no protection at all. Uh, but I'm happy to say, more than two decades later, that there has been a lot of good work. It all began with those surveys I referred to earlier, because if you're going to protect something, mm. you need to know what's left and where it is. So those surveys were the groundwork. And since that groundwork, the Great Wall has been staked out. Every province, they've put in concrete posts like 100 yards away from the wall with the two characters, Chang Chang. And, uh, you know, listeners are probably thinking, well, anyone who sees the Great Wall knows that's the Great Wall. And they know it needs protecting. And uh, that's because people think all of the Great Wall is, you know, uh, 15, 25 feet high and made of stone and brick and has a tower every 100 yards. But no, if we go to the west of China, even on the Ming Wall, the, 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 the Great Wall out in Gansu province, in Ningxia, in Shanxi, doesn't look like that. It's just made, it was just made of rammed earth. So I think in some areas of the U.S., in the Southwest, indigenous people, uh, and maybe even today, the simplest way to build a, you know, a, a, a compound is to wet the earth and to uh, shovel it into a frame and uh, 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 ram it down and then take the wooden framework away and let it bake in the sun and basically have a soft pottery wall. So that's the way they made uh, walls out, uh, you know, in the area of the Silk Road in Gansu and Ningxia. Um, and, you know, some sections of those walls have weathered well, but vast lengths have been washed away, you know, by the occasional, you know, summer downpour. And then, you know, flash floods in nearby mountains would channel and be very forceful in a small area so you can get, get a breach of, uh, you know, a few hundred meters. And, oh, yeah, the, the condition of the wall varies greatly along its length. But generally, the further you go back in time, the worse condition the wall is. That very good section of chin wall that I referred to earlier, that is, is it's pretty much a miracle section that because of its remoteness, because the distance, you know, of any uh, sizable community was far, people didn't pillage it. All kinds of factors involved in, you know, whether a section of wall is well preserved or not. But certainly natural damage and uh, human damage are equally forceful factors. Yeah, well, in the, in the consciousness of everybody all over the world, I think it's safe to say it's, it's Xi Jinping and his Great Wall that is the... Great Wall. So what did what did he do? I mean, is that he designed that look like when you go to Bada Ling, that look, the towers, is that that was all him? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The Great Wall as the world knows it today is I think the architectural design uh vision implemented of Commander Chi Guang who lived in the uh 1500s. I think uh I think he was born in like 1528 and died in uh, about 15, uh, 1580 sometime. So uh, his career, certainly the latter part of it, was dominated by the Great Wall. And uh, I call this period of Great Wall architecture that he was responsible for the period of grandeur. You know, you mentioned Bad Aling there, and uh, everyone knows. Even if you haven't been to China, you know Bad Aling. You saw, as I did uh, before I even came to China, that picture that crops up everywhere of President uh, Nixon on the wall in 1972, the wall snaking away behind him and uh, a few like guard houses. So those guard houses, uh, technically speaking, they're known as Kung Xing Dilo. 
kind of a direct translation would be empty space, enemy platforms, but uh, in understandable English, towers with enclosed space. Watchtowers, I think, is a good one-word description. And so as you're walking along the wall, every hundred yards, you enter a arched doorway. The, the wooden doors have gone, of course. And inside there are aisles and chambers. Really, uh, these are the components of the Ming Wall that transformed the linear defence into a performing active defence. So um, what's Chi Ji Guang's story? Um, he was a brilliant young military man and uh, he actually won his spurs. He, he gained a great reputation for dealing with one of the Ming Empire's big headaches. That was the attacks on coastal communities in uh, along the, uh, the 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 Chinese coast, um, so uh, Jap- particularly Japanese pirates would 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 raid coastal communities, and they kind of got a bit big for their boots and made forays of several hundred miles inland, uh, even as far uh, up the Yangtze River uh, as Nanjing. So. Um, um, uh, Qi Ji Guang really did a good job fighting uh, Japanese pirates. And um, in 1568, the, the Jiajing emperor of the Ming dynasty died and a new emperor was installed. He'd, he'd uh, be known as the Lungqing emperor. And his, uh, one of his top men, the prime minister, advised the Lungqing Emperor to utilise the superb military acumen of um, Commander Qi Ji Guang in the south. So up, came, up comes Qi Ji Guang, and he's given one of the big nine military regions that the Ming Dynasty Great Wall is divided into. He's given one of these military regions to, to administer, and the military region is the Ji region. So it's basically from, from Beijing to uh, Shanghai Guan, where the Ming Dynasty Great Wall reaches the sea. And um, Qi Ji Guang uh, spends much of his first year or so out in the field. He makes an inspection tour along the existing wall, which is very lengthy at this time. And he compiles a policy proposal which kind of looks at how the wall has been performing um, in, in, in recent decades, and, uh, uh, but takes also into account, you know, the honest feedback of the men who are manning the wall. And basically the policy proposal says, remember 1550, just a few decades ago? like a whole bunch of uh, nomads, Mongols, came through the wall, apparently, and opposed. There was a great mess up at a place called Gubeko, and they looted the area between the Great Wall and Beijing City Wall for weeks. And they loaded up their carts, and they made their way out. And... um, the, the judging emperor was was um, led to believe that you know the army put up a great fight and it was all lies and basically the great wall failed in 1550. Why? So this was the purpose of Qi Ji Guang's field inspection visit, and his his conclusion was that those manning the wall at that time were few and far between. They relied too heavily on sighting the enemy calling for reinforcements, but were not confident the reinforcements would arrive in a timely manner. And therefore, many of them deserted their posts, and that's why the Mongols got through in 1550. So, this is the bottom line. Dear Lungqing Emperor, if you want your wall to work, there has to be a redesign. And the redesign must be focused on 
providing more accommodation for man on the wall, providing more space for weapons, and training man specifically in the skills needed to fight from the platform that is the Great Wall of China. So his policy proposal included that a new architectural element be added to the existing line of the wall. And the new architectural element was the watchtower with enclosed space. So this is what many people do not realize. You know, had you been walking along the Great Wall, just 100 miles north of Beijing, through Hebei province, to where it meets uh, the Bohai Gulf, the Yellow Sea, had you been making that hike in 1550, you would not pass through any of these towers with hollow space. You'd get to these platforms with little sheds on top, and you'd meet a couple of blokes in each one with a few uh, pottery jars of gunpowder a couple of bows and a couple of flags and a drum, enough food and water for two or three days. So uh, Qi Jiguang said, but the new style tower, as I am proposing, should provide enough space for 20 or 30 men, and it should give them enough space for storing what they need, water, food, and weapons, to sustain a 50-day battle. Now, so this was a major revamp. And Qi Jiguang proposed that more than 3,000 of these towers be added to the existing line of the wall. And they should be added at the peaks, the dips, and the turns along the line of the wall. And he proposed that guards in adjacent towers should be able to cover the outside face of the wall with their overlapping arrow or crossbow bolt range. So this was a major redesign project. It was going to cost a lot of money. I try to explain this to children this way, and adults. I often say, imagine you're the mayor of a city that has a subway system. Uh, has a few lines, but the problem with the subway system is the stations are too far apart. The stations are five kilometers apart. What you need to do is add a station every 100 meters. Imagine the work you'd have to do building all of these platforms. So basically, Xi Jiguang's workforce was going to have to add a watchtower every 100 meters. They have to open up the wall, build the tower, and then build the wall back to the tower again. And also, the building of a tower is much more difficult than the building of a wall. Building of the battlements, even if you're using bricks, it's just one brick on top of another. But if you're building hollow space inside a tower, You've got archways, you need wooden frames, you need supports, and you can't do this in stone. You need bricks. You can't make bricks on mountaintops. You can only make bricks down in the valleys. So the cost of the proposal was staggering. It transformed the Ming Great Wall into a defence made of materials that could be gathered very locally to a defense that included prefabricated materials, bricks, that would have to be transported considerable distances. Minimal, you're talking about possibly half a mile, but on average, you're talking about several miles. There is a site in Hebei where they found more than 200 brick kilns in a valley, and that kiln site is about four miles from the actual wall and about four to 500 meters lower altitude. So you have distance and height to face the delivery man of the bricks. So the costs were going up. Okay, so what happened? Xi Jiguang managed in his decade 
of jurisdiction of the G region to add approximately 1,000 towers along the existing line of the wall. And if you want to see his epitaph, you come to Beijing, you drive just north of Beijing or into Hebei province, and you see the wallscape that remains from his efforts today. And that is the Great Wall's period of grandeur. What kind of weapons were being used by the soldiers? I saw in your book, the 50 Objects book, the rock bombs, blunderbusses. Some of these look very nasty, nasty weapons there. What were they uh, using up there? And they and they were able to store ammunition, store weapons? Is that something in the, in the towers that they, what, one of its purposes? Yeah, well, one of the purposes of the towers was to, uh, yeah, provide storage space for the essential weapons. And in the Ming Dynasty, uh, you've got a, a transition period. You've got uh, uh, the use of cold weapons, so these stalwart weapons that were used for time immemorial. I mean, crossbows were used in the Han Dynasty along the Great Wall, and they were still using crossbows on the Ming Wall. They were still using bows, but uh, gunpowder, of course, had been invented uh, from round about the uh, 1100s. But uh, the problem with gunpowder weapons was the uh, automatic ignition. The blunderbuss that you referred to, which is a Ming Dynasty weapon, was probably used by commanders on the wall. So I'm sure Xi Jiguang, for example, had a blunderbuss. Uh, uh, but it was carried, I think, more for impressing people. Hmm. The problem with these weapons, such as the Shotong or blunderbuss, was it apparently took about two minutes to reload. Uh, so on a windy day up on the Great Wall, which uh, would be you know, very common weather, uh, you wouldn't want to be fiddling with uh, igniting your blunderbuss. Uh, during a raid, uh, I believe most of the ordinary rank and file soldiers preferred the cold weapons of the crossbow and the uh, composite bow, which could be, uh, you know, deliver a, a shot, an arrow, a bolt, certainly a number per minute. Um, the a very interesting weapon that I found in the Lee of the Ming War in the mountain areas north of Beijing is the, the rock bomb and the landmine. So uh, again, um, uh, nice uh, story with children. When, you, when I show children these weapons, and if you can imagine a really big pineapple without the, you know, the, uh, the leaves at one end, uh, a chunk of rock like that, uh, an igneous rock, at one end, it just, you know, just it's just rock. But at the other end, there's a hollow. And when I show children these, I say, what age do you think this weapon dates from? The Stone Age? And they say, yeah, yeah, the Stone Age. And then I turn it around and I show them the hole. And I say, no, uh, it's made of stone, but this isn't a Stone Age weapon. This is a hot weapon. In other words, it used gunpowder. So basically, it's basically a, a container for housing an explosion and the opening directs the explosion uh, in the face of the enemy. And um, I found these in the rubble of watchtowers along the wall, smaller ones that were stored up in towers. Uh, they would have been uh, had a, a short fuse uh, lit, thrown off the wall, I think probably just one or two seconds before they're due to explode. And the plan was for this to explode at the foot of the wall. And then uh, larger versions of these weapons known as landmines, delay in Chinese, these were buried where the enemy was likely to pass. And um, Xi Jiguang wrote a manual uh, on military training. And in the manual, uh, he describes this weapon. And uh, he seems to be, have been quite a uh, proponent of these weapons. Uh, I guess he realized that certain times of the year, many of the men on the wall 
they have free time and they could use that time, you know, doing a bit of chipping away to make these stone weapons, these, these rock bombs and landmines. But generally, you know, the weapons used on the Great Walls of China from 300 BC until just a few centuries ago, it's, 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 a, it's a reflection of the weapons used in this theatre of war in this part of the world generally. Whatever weapons developments were made, they, they may have been utilised up on the wall. Well, gee, we're, uh, I've been keeping you for so long. I know you got to start your day there in uh, Beijing. Maybe uh, why don't we do this when uh, Jimmy and Tommy are done after they've already uh, walked all the way to Shanghai Guan? Are you going to be waiting there at Shanghai Guan for them uh, <laughs> when they get to the end? I'd, uh, actually, um, they are already in Shanghai Guan, and many people uh. perceive that as the eastern end of the Ming Dynasty Great Wall. But uh, I'm afraid um, the vast majority of people have been hoodwinked. Yeah, but, well, uh, if you look at a, a, a map of uh, the wall, uh, most maps show the wall ending there. And I call it the seaside terminus, but the true eastern terminus of the Ming Wall is a little bit further round the corner in the northeast. Uh, Manchuria, as it's often referred to, in Liaoning province. So there's a town in Liaoning province called Dandong, which is on the Yalu River, uh, just across the river from today's North Korea. And that is the definite eastern end of the Ming Wall. So the boys have that last bit to do through the last province of uh, Liaoning. Uh, There's not much wall left there. But, you know, for the sake of completeness, they're um, really determined to get there uh, and do the last, uh, yeah, 500 miles before, you know, the real harsh winter weather kicks in. So it would be great when they get back to uh, come and talk to uh, you and listeners again. And we can have uh, a more kind of modern history of the war, my journey in 1987 and their journey in, in 2022. Yeah, let's for sure do that. So I still have my questions I haven't even asked you, but we've been going on for so long and I shan't keep you any longer. This sure flew by and after so many months of waiting for my, my brush with greatness. <laughs> <laughs> so, William, this was such a great pleasure. And for a pipsqueak like me to get this chance to interview someone like you, it was uh, quite special indeed. To the best of my knowledge, I believe you're the first officer of the British Empire to appear on this program. Shoot, the Beatles are only MBEs. Uh, uh, It's been a a, a great fun. I always like talking about the Great Wall uh, to receptive audiences. Thanks very much, Laszlo. All right, let's just leave it at that. My deepest thanks once again, William, for taking the time to appear on the CHP and discussing the history of the Great Wall and its place in your life. Now my sister could finally stop asking me to do a Great Wall episode. So thanks for listening, one and all. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles. As usual, please consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.